We are now going to have a question and answer time. Uh, originally, it was planned that uh, Dr. Block would give another plenary. You have some notes, so you can see them. He will be mentioning something of that plenary as we're in the Q&A. What we want to do during this time is really focus in on how we can be teaching and preaching the Old Testament, and in particular, the book of Deuteronomy. I, one thing I did learn through this session, and it was impressed upon me years ago because I was converted under the ministry of John Moore, is that every once in a while as he was preaching, he would go to the piano and start to sing. Um, I never attempted that at my first churches, and I still will not attempt that, even though I'm being encouraged today by Dr. Block to do so. <laughs> Anyways, it's been so good to have him with us and to minister to us. Now, Dr. Reed is going to ask him some questions, and then we will have a time when you can ask some questions. Thanks, Dr. Housen. As you know, as this is the preaching lectures, we thought we would uh, drill down with Dr. Block here, ask him some questions uh, that he hasn't actually seen in advance, but I'm sure he's thought of in advance. Some questions related to how do we preach a book like Deuteronomy? How do we teach it? How do we come at it? So I have a handful of questions that I'm going to prime the pump with, and then we'll throw it open to any of you if you have a question. You'll need to, when we get there, just stand up, shout it out. I'll repeat it for the sake of the video, and then Dr. Block will try to deal with it, okay? So, you know, we, I, if you're like me, you've been hearing uh, Dr. Block exposit these texts, and there's some of us that are going, I'd love to be able to do that, but how do you do that? It's kind of like watching Sidney Crosby, you know, score goals. It's like, you know, I see you doing it, but I'm not sure how to translate that to me and my pond hockey team. So uh, we're going to try to ask him some questions on what we can take away in order to better preach this. So Dr. Block, here's my first question for you. If you were one of us and you were, pre, you know, you announced to your folks, we're going to be in Deuteronomy. Two questions. How would you tackle that? Would you tend to go chapter one, verse one, and just start today we're in verse chapter one or half of chapter one and we're going to take seven years and we're going to get through it and they're all going to be excited, 180 of them showing up every week. Would you, how would you tackle it? And then secondly, how would you encourage people to think this is going to be life-changing? Because some of them would immediately think, why can't we just do Galatians or John? Why do we have to be in Deuteronomy? So how would you tackle it and how would you market it to your own people? Well, I, 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 I wouldn't, are, are we on? I, I wouldn't set out to preach through the whole book of Deuteronomy uh, the way in which we've been doing Deuteronomy in our class. Here, get this for now until we get you fixed. That flicked in both ways. Are, are we on now? We're on now? Uh, I, I wouldn't do it the way we're doing it in class, but, but this is really interesting, isn't it? In our traditions, we have no questions about pastors, and some of you have done it, going th preaching through Romans and taking three, four years, going through Romans, line by line, verse by verse, uh, or Galatians, mm -hmm. you do six months on Galatians. Well, if you do that with Galatians, why wouldn't you do it with Deuteronomy? The, the theological presentation is just as dense and just as rich. And in my view, more exciting than Galatians. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, Galatians is a dark book. Um, that's my next project, actually. The one that's coming out there, it has an introductory on Galatians. Hmm. I'm, I, I've lived 15 years with Ezekiel, 20 years with Moses. My next 10 are with Paul hmm. in Galatians. 
This is scary because Old Testament guys don't do this. Mm -hmm. And the first essay coming out, in, it, it, it'll be in, in this book, it is on hearing Galatians with Moses. Um, um, Paul as a second and seconding Moses. Hmm. I'm, I start out by saying I imagine that um, I, Moses and I are standing in one of the Galatian churches. And when this letter, this epistle is being read, and the whole thing would be read out loud, occasionally I lean over to Moses and I say, did you say that? Did Paul get you right? Mm -hmm. How can he do that? And I hear sometimes Moses saying, yeah, you got me exactly right. And sometimes he said, ooh, I don't know. But the other side of it is, in this one essay, I argue first that Paul views himself to be a prophet in the tradition of Moses. That's chapter 1. He's setting himself up. But I'm testing it with the second half is circumcision. On the matter of circumcision in Paul's debate with the Judaizers. Now, I'm not a New Testament scholar. I'm, just, I'm, I'm walking on scary ground because my, my kind of people don't do this. But I asked, my, I asked Moses the question, and Paul's debate with the Judaizers, on which side would Moses have been? Have you ever thought about that? And in Acts, of course, they talk about circumcised according to the custom of Moses. That's Moses, and this is the custom of Moses. On which side is, is, is Moses? And I've discovered on that point, Moses would have been exactly on Paul's side. Wow. Have you ever thought what Moses does about circumcision? Nothing. Physical circumcision? Or what Moses says about physical circumcision? Nothing. Moses neither talks about it nor does it. There is one place in Leviticus where there's, it's the law on, on purification after the birth of a child. And then there's a, by the way, on the eighth day that is to be circumcised, that boy is to be... But that's God talking. It's not Moses talking. Moses never talks about circumcision. And you know, you know the story in Exodus chapter 4 where he's on the way back to Egypt and God is about to take his life. And in the nick of time, <laughs> his Midianite wife circumcises his son. I say, Moses, where you been? And the other side of it is, when the Israelites cross the Jordan River and get to Gilgal, what's the first thing they have to do? Circumcise, circumcise all the males, for the text says, since they left Egypt, they, they had not been circumcising any of the males. And I say, Moses, where you been? Hmm. I assume that the generation that left Egypt were circumcised because Exodus 12, 13 says, if Aliens want to participate in Passover, they may, but they must be circumcised first, like the native. So I'm assuming that generation. But the interesting thing is, they were circumcised, but they died in the desert. The new generation were not circumcised, but they get the inheritance. Interesting. Go figure. Interesting. He, he obviously knows it because he uses the metaphor. Chapter 10, chapter 30, he knows the metaphor. But Moses does nothing about circumcision. Wow. That's why I was going to end with Deuteronomy 10. What now does the Lord your God require of you? And of course, if you talk to Judaizers, the point is circumcision, keep kosher food laws, keep the Sabbath as the Pharisees have defined it, and festivals. Those Jimmy Dunn, keeping the laws, basically these external right. identity markers. 
What does Moses say? What now does the Lord your God require of you? That's the question he asks. And then he says, circumcision, keep food laws. No, he doesn't. But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with your whole heart. And then the little pinky. Keep the commands. Really? This is why fear, first principle of wisdom, it's your thumb. Five, circumcision. Oh, then he does talk in, when he's expounding this two or th in verse 16. This is 12 and 13. In 16, he says, circumcise your hearts. But it's not physical circumcision. Moses is, a, or I should say, Paul on that point is exactly where Moses is. And, and the other side of this is, fundamentally, Paul cannot disagree with Moses. He can't. Moses was as inspired as Paul was. And if it sounds like Paul and Moses are on different pages, don't talk to Moses. That's not Moses' fault. You talk to Paul and you ask Paul, how can you do that? And I think there's an answer to that one. I think one of the things that we want to drill into in just yes. a moment is what you've hidden it. And how do you apply what you're getting out of yep. Deuteronomy across the uh, epics, Old Covenant, New Covenant, yep. across the cross? So, but can I still back you up a little bit? If you're, if you're preaching through Deuteronomy, yep. Yep. would that be a series of like five messages? Would you go all the way from start to finish if it took you three years? No, I wouldn't. Um, because your people don't have a stomach for it. We were in North Oldham Church, and we got a new pastor, and this church had, they were down to about 20 people when we first joined, and, and they were on the left side of the spectrum, and they got a new pastor who was on the right side of the theological spectrum, and right off the bat, he was going to preach uh, expository preaching. They'd never had him, and he started Romans. Well, about five weeks into it, he called me up, and this is what we would do regularly. He says, can we go do Dairy Queen? <laughs> and you know what that, and he says, it's not going down so well. And the fact is, they were gagging. <laughs> now, if, I would never have done that. I love Romans. But you don't start babies on steak. I would have done a short book. First John. But it has to be Paul, of course, we're so Pauline. We don't know what to do with John. Uh, uh, you know, I just started with, so in Deuteronomy, I would, I would say, hmm, let's take the first address of Moses. Okay. Chapters 1 to 4, 44. That's a good manageable section. And give yourself a quarter, 12 Sundays to that. And of course, it climaxes in what we've been doing here in the gospel. I might even turn it around and then work my way backwards. Because historically, that was Israel's experience. Because you want your people, it may not be evident, but I do have an education degree. <laughs> and when we were at the University of Saskatchewan, we were told, you go from the known to the unknown, from to that which is appreciated to that which is not appreciated. So I might start with the salvation text because chronologically, logically, I mean, there's no rule that says you have to go in that sequence. We might, but you know what else I would do? The first Sunday. I do this with like people in my class. When we got going on Deuteronomy after two or three weeks of introduction to the book, then I read, I read chapters one, two, three, and four the whole thing out loud. And I hope it was expositorily. There's such a thing as expository reading of Scripture. So people get the point. And it, for the Sunday, we've got an hour. It took about 45 minutes. And then I stood back and I asked, what did the Lord say to you? It was amazing. Wow. I just read but that's a lost art. 
both the reading of Scripture and the hearing. So in a case like this, I wouldn't do the whole book of Deuteronomy. I would do the first three chapters, four, four chapters, and that would get you enough. And people want to get into the New Testament again? All right, I'll, I'll give them the note. <laughs> um, and then I'd come back and next year. Let's resume Deuteronomy. And then I would do chapters 5 through... Could we do 5 through 11? Is that too much? Uh, but in some instances, you work for smaller segments of a particular text, like the Shema text. You've got to devote a whole sermon to uh, 6, right. 4 to 9. That's one sermon. Uh, you know, so give yourself 15 weeks on the next, you know, chapters 5 through... Of, of, of course, you've got the Decalogue. And that alone is worth a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, on the other hand, there may come a time when you simply preach the Decalogue. What is the theology driving this document? Yes. And that's a sermon worth hearing. Good. See the rose. We'll come back next year and look at the petals. Okay. So let's say this is your congregation and yeah. you've just finished up Galatians, and next Sunday you're going to start into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, going through verse 4. Give us what you would say to your congregation so that they actually show up next week. Okay? <laughs> Eager, ready to hear the word of the Lord. Well, how would you tell them this is what we're going to do and this is why it's oh, going to be so important? Oh, I, I, I can't speak for you. I can only see. When we started this class, there were 35 in the class. We're now up to 180 to 200 on a Sunday morning. What in the world is going on? That's bigger than some of your churches. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some high-powered people in the class as well. What would, what would I do? I would invite the people, to, as they prepare for the sermon series, go home and read the whole text aloud for yourself a half a dozen times. I would announce it several weeks in advance. We're going to do this. And I would invite them to read it in different translations. Read it in ESV, which is formal, you know, formal translation theory. Read it in NLT, which is big picture kind of stuff. Uh, read it in NIV, which is a good Chevrolet. It's this and that both. Uh, gets you where you're going, but it's not wooden enough for me to be a study text. It's not, it, it, it's not dynamic enough to me to be, you're still having to explain English words, and that's the problem. So, I, I'm very difficult to satisfy, and so, anyhow, and I, I, I it's, it's an attitude towards the First Testament that we have to embody. And if we can do that, and this is where Deuteronomy is the key. This is the Romans of the First Testament, most systematic presentation of theological truth. It is also the Gospel of John, the most theological presentation of history and God's great act of salvation. And so I would, I would, I would preach Deuteronomy before Genesis any day because Deuteronomy is the heart and soul of the whole Scripture, including Genesis. Well, if you gave us that promo, I think that would pique our interest, right? It's the uh, heart and soul of Scripture. It's the John of the Old Testament. It's the Romans. It's, that's awesome. Not everybody can get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a question I think many of us are going to have, and you alluded to this, Dr. Block. When it comes to bringing the theology and the truth that's embedded in uh, Moses' words in Deuteronomy across the ages and speaking to the people in Cambridge or wherever else yeah. we are, in Wheaton, wherever you are, how do you do that in a way that is accurate, true to the spirit of the text? Yeah. It's the, how, do, how do you do that? Give us some help on that because there's so many specifics that we stumble on. Today you talked about the rebellious son not being stoned, yeah. but there's many others, right? There's the text about the clothes. There's a text about yeah. sexuality things. What would you help us on that? Well, I think, I think what we need to do is, A, stop asking, do Christians have to keep this? It's the wrong question. 
two, and I'm going to get myself in real trouble here because I'm against the Niagara of the Reformed tradition. Stop dividing the laws into moral, ceremonial, and civil. Amen. <laughs> that was Dr. Barker, by the way. Read Chris Wright. Yes. And on these counts, Chris Wright is the, as close to me as anybody out there. And it, there are classes of laws in the Bible, but these aren't them. Leviticus 19. If my students wrote term papers like that, I'd send it back and say, nice first draft. Now make an essay of it. Because it's a hodgepodge. Everything is disorganized. He moves from sacrificial stuff to ethical stuff to theological. And without, I mean, never announcing. And I say, what's the point? And the point is, all of life is holy. There's no such thing as dividing it into the sacred and the profane. Stop it. All of life. And so that's, that, that's what we have to do. So that when there is a text like... I mean, the food thing this morning, do I keep the food laws? I, I have lots of Seventh-day Adventist friends. They've gone beyond these food laws to vegetarian. It, it's apparently a natural move on their part. There are lots of them that have gone. No, I don't, I don't go there. I, I, I enjoyed my burger last night, and it had cheese on it. <laughs> um, so... Uh, but there's something going on here in every text we need to ask, not only, I mean, again, it's speech act. The words people use, the point they're trying to make, and then the point we are seeing, which is often quite different from the point there. So in some of these strange texts, you shall not plow with an ox and an ass together. What relevance has that got for Toronto, Cambridge, whatever, Markham? You shall not plow with an ox. It seems so arbitrary. But of course, if you've grown up on the farm and you see the different biology of these two animals, you know that this is wrong. It's abuse of one animal. And presumably, the donkey cannot keep up with the ox. And you're forcing the donkey to keep. And that's wrong. That's abuse, animal abuse. You know, so that's not a hard one. It is not an arbitrary thing. Now, the business of you shall not sow a field with two kinds of grain or whatever, that's a different one uh, here. When I was growing up on the farm for our cattle, we regularly put, we mixed barley and oats. But that's not what we're talking about. I think what he's talking about, an olive garden or an olive grove and a vineyard, two different fields. A part of this is to respect the trees, <laughs> but I'm going to sound far too green on some of this stuff, and it's okay. Uh, but on, let, let an olive tree be an olive tree and don't com compromise it. But the other side of it is, God's people should be characterized by order rather than chaos. And in that cultural context, a Canaanite should have been able to spot an Israelite's field a mile away because their world is an ordered world. I hope that my neighbors see that our world is an ordered world and it is an act of worship. So that our home is not an embarrassment to the neighborhood. Stuff is in its place. I think that's a matter of witness. We were at North Oldham Church. Um, Theobald, Dave, was there with us. But we moved into this church, and the, it was run down and whatever else, and you drive by, I've forgotten what the name of the highway, you drive by it on the road, and you say, boy, that's a pathetic outfit down there. We decided to dress it up. And immediately people noticed, ooh, something's happening there. And all of a sudden, everything about us sends a signal. 
we have created a little Eden, which is the a foretaste of where we're headed, at least where I think I'm headed. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and this is, I think, this is the theology of that kind of separation. How do you know when you're abstracting from the specifics to a more generalized theological yeah. truth, how do you know when you are going too high and lofty and going to some kind of theological premise when others would say, well, why don't we just keep it exactly the same? Why don't we just say, don't dare wear fabric of the same kind, don't do this? What's wrong with that thinking? I probably don't do it as well as I create the impression I think I do. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about the answer, and, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure I always get it right. Okay. But I work very hard at getting at it. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't even try. Right. So, so I think we need always, all of these laws, we need to ask, what is the point? And the point of the parapet is not the parapet. The point is the health and well-being of your household. And anybody who comes in there, and that's, that, that's the way it always should be. So and this is why Jesus can summarize all the laws in one. Covenant commitment to the Lord your God and covenant commitment to your neighbor and then everything else will fall in place. Very what good. you've got in the laws are not exhaustive regulations to be used in court to prove whether a person is guilty or not. That's not the point. The point is to give hundreds of illustrations of what covenant life looks like. Wow. And from there we extrapolate. Uh, and here we talked about Boaz in the book of Ruth. In my view, Boaz embodies Deuteronomic theology perfectly. Not because he's read Deuteronomy and he's trying to live by the letter of the law. There are allusions to the leveret marriage in the book, and there are allusions to principles of redemption of people who are... But the laws don't fit his circumstance. But he says, I don't need a law to live by the values that these laws teach. And so he let the Spirit. Here's a guy who is guided by Torah, but driven by the Spirit. Hmm. And I think that's where we've got to get land. Uh, you know, the life of disciplined adherence to the commands of God to an outsider may look exactly like the life of a legalist. The difference is motivation. And not everybody gets that, but if, That's right. but if I don't go to the movies, and I don't, my wife, I can count on two hands how many times we've been in a theater together in 51 years of marriage. I've got far better things to do than waste my time. Three hours I'll never get back. I'd rather, I'd rather weed in my garden. I mean, there's... N Ah, I'm Dutch, so... <laughs> you know, there's nothing redeemable. I go see Lord of the Rings with my grandkids. Not to see the violence of Lord of the Rings. First time I saw this, whoa! What's the point of all this? And you read the books, and the books are far better than the movies anyhow. And, and, and so, I don't go to movies. Is that a matter of legalistic? I don't think so. I think it's a matter of principle. I, it's a waste of my time. I've got better, more fun things to do than that. You know, but I'm not saying you shouldn't. I do think that there are lots of movies you shouldn't see. Mm -hmm. But we've lost those boundaries too. So be thinking, I'm going to throw it open here in just a moment for any questions. We're going to try to keep it mostly focused on the preaching side of it. If you can, I mean, we could explore the theological intricacies of this. And uh, if you have questions on that, you know, maybe we'll have a little time at the end. But I'd like you to, since this is a preaching lecture, be thinking about something that relates to preaching. But I got one more for you. Um, have you always, is it a God-given wiring you to be so expressive? You articulate very clearly. You would be a great person for new Canadians to listen to because you don't, you don't rush your words, slur your words. Uh, you articulate well. You are expressive with your whole body, your eyes. 
you know, you act probably younger than your years in terms of, you know, your energy level. Have you always spoken that way? Have you learned to speak that way? Because I felt it was very, very engaging. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, I, I, I am a total introvert. My daughter says there are, twin, there are twins in our family. They're 50 years, 58 years apart. That's my grandson and me. Hmm. And he's absolutely happiest when he's in his own room and his sisters leave him alone. <laughs> he doesn't need company. Hey, frankly, between you and me and the fence post, when I was young, <laughs> my ambition was to be a long-distance truck driver. And I was working for a farmer in western Saskatchewan who had land right next to the Yellowhead. And I'd be driving the tractor. I, you know what was fun about driving the tractor? I'm by myself all day. Yeah. Nobody bothered me. But I, I'd see the big rigs going by and I said, what could be greater than starting in Halifax and driving all the way to Vancouver? That would be fabulous. That's where I'm happiest. So have we ever... The, the other interesting thing, if you look at pictures from our family when we were kids, there aren't many around, but I'm never on any of the pictures. <laughs> and everybody's asking, where's Dan? <laughs> Who knows where he is? <laughs> you, you, you know what got me going? Two things. Two people. When I was at Trinity, Walt Kaiser... I had never seen a person who got so excited about the First Testament. and he, He's not the one who lit the spark in my life, but he fanned it into flame. And I hope he is honored by my saying that. The other thing is, I lived for 15 years with Ezekiel, and that changed my life. If I, were, I used to teach homiletics. I still teach for Master Seminary, uh, the Demon uh, course. I, I go and lecture for them on expository preaching of the Old Testament. This is great fun with those guys. But uh, if I were teaching homiletics again, I would use Ezekiel as a textbook. Because here's a guy who knows his audience, who knows what he's supposed to preach, and who explores absolutely every conceivable way of getting that point across. And so when I break into song, my kids say, Dad, you got to get that fixed. <laughs> you know, they're embarrassed by that. And yet I run across people 10 years later and they say, I don't remember what you preached about, but I remember what you sang. And I say, whoa, where'd that come from? You know, Ezekiel has given me, there are times when I'm, I'm all for appropriate dignity to the occasion. But there are times when I wear a baseball cap when I preach. Totally out of character. You wear it when you're preaching? And when I'm preaching. And it's on a particular sermon, bearing the name. Mm. I'll never forget that's a story. That's right. <laughs> when, when, when our son was small, he had, he had just broken his arm and it was in a big cast and Saskatchewan Rough Riders were playing the Bombers. And we were living in Manitoba at the time. But if you're from Saskatchewan, one thing you will never do is cheer for the Bombers. <laughs> never. In any case, we were at the Bombers game, and on the first play, Ron Lancaster throws to Huey Campbell, who became coach of Edmonton later, traitor. Uh, uh, he throws to Huey Campbell, first play of the game, and he ran all the way for the touchdown. And my son and I, we were up, yes, yes, yes. And the guy behind us said, sit down and shut up or I'll break your other arm. Whoa. I mean, there, if, 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 if you wear a, a Buffalo shirt at a Toronto Maple Leafs, game in Maple Leaf Gardens, watch it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit. It's a declaration of allegiance and loyalty. And so, to illustrate that, 
in the sermon on, you shall not bear the name of the Lord your God, which is not about cussing. It's about representing God. We've been stamped with his name, branded. And everywhere we go, we represent him. Wow. Jesus is Lord. You better watch how you drive <laughs> if you're wearing that shirt. That's right. That's bearing the name in vain. So Ezekiel liberated me to, to be creative, imaginative. And I think we've lost imagination. And I encourage my kids to be imaginative. And uh, I don't know. That was awesome. I, I think uh, those of us who sat through, I think, found ourselves uh, captivated yeah. by the content, but also by the way you were so captivated by it. You know, I think that it was clear that this, this truth was living in you, it had changed you, it had shaped you, and that exuded from you in so many ways. That's the key to preaching, is embodiment, incarnation. And your sermon better hit you first before it hits the congregation. I feel sorry for congregations whose pri who, the primary function of their pastors in studying Scripture is to get a sermon ready for them. That's not a good place to be. The king is to embody Torah before he does anything. And this is, the, this is biblical leadership. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. He embodied something. And this is where proclamation of Ezra set his heart to study, to apply, and to preach. Has to be in that order. Has to be in that order. Or we got a problem. And so, uh, that's not accidental. Uh, so, I try. I, I also, uh, this is my last question, so be ready with yours. You also had a fascinating way to me to blend what I would call obviously deep level study and, um, you know, really uh, high grade exegetical work with very common parlance. You would flip into a study or a story of whether it was a farm story or a sports story. Is that intentional on your part? Because on one, it seems rather highbrow, right? It's here, we're dealing with Hebrew words, Hebrew text, and then you're talking about, you know, riding the tractor or whatever. Do you try to, or is that just who you are? So I don't know how that works because I'm surprised every time I hear people say that. And I actually do hear that quite often. Uh, I, I mean, they, they know the depth at which I've worked and they're shocked by... That you're a normal person. That right? I'm a normal person <laughs> yeah. and that we've actually communicated something that we understand at a very deep level. Uh, I don't know how that works. Uh, I, I think I try to work at it. I have a wife who reminds me occasionally. <laughs> they didn't get it. Uh -huh. You know, and so, and this is why working with a Sunday school class every Sunday morning as opposed to a class yeah. at the seminary or grad school or whatever is so helpful. These people aren't studying for exams. These people are living where the world is, and they want a word from God for them for life, good. not to pass a test. And I think that kind of connection with ordinary people every day has got to be. My, my heart is for the church. Amen. And that's one of the reasons why I'm there on Sunday morning when I'm not somewhere else. That's very good. Okay, let's throw it up. We've got just a few minutes left, but questions for Dr. Block? Anyone just stand up and shout it if you got one, and I'll repeat it uh, so we can have it on the tape. Anything you got? Let me just uh, say what Andrew said. You alluded this morning to how we have to be careful of typology, how in some sense it diminishes our view of Christ. Can you expand a little bit on then what to do? Uh, m my students and people who know me, the people in my class for seven years, never hear me talk about typology. 
It's not because I'm against it. I am against undisciplined and irresponsible typologizing. So I avoid the word altogether because it communicates something that I'm not trying to communicate. Words matter. You know, so, and, and I try and work within a very disciplined framework. There are obvious types, but I let the Bible define those as types. And if they don't, I won't. Illustration. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted. Is that a type of Christ? My answer is absolutely not. It doesn't work. It's a serpent. How can this serpent who is, or normally symbolizes all that's evil, the serpent is lifted up. No, this is not typology. Jesus is trying to make a point to Nicodemus. Is it to Nicodemus? He's trying to make a point. How does this work? As Moses lifted up the serpent and the people experienced healing when they looked up at the serpent. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that healing come to them. That serpent has nothing to do with Jesus, in my view. It has to do with the healing of Israel. They're being bitten by serpents and they cry out and God in His mercy rescues them. Well, and to that extent, it may be paradigmatic, but it is not pointing forward to anything. It is pointing to a real need that God in His mercy solves then. Jesus points to a far greater need, and He says, look up to me. It's an analogy. It's a picture. It's an illustration. It doesn't point forward at all. Jesus wants to make a point, and he says, he picks this up from the, from the First Testament. He says, here, they, they looked up to the serpent and were healed. One day, they'll look up to me. That's all. Jesus is far bigger than snake. And, and so, biblical writers were typically preachers, not exegetes. That doesn't mean they didn't do exegesis, but they were doing rhetoric. And so a lot of what they're doing is to make a new theological point. Uh, so uh, I, I, I will not, I will, Chris Wright, again, I'm in, deeply indebted to my good friend Chris Wright. He uses the words of paradigmatic. Early events are paradigmatic. That does not mean they point to future events. It means that something happens here which sets a pattern that you see here later. And it provides the vocabulary for later discussion. That's a different thing. Very good I, point. Yeah. Very good point. Anyone else? We do need to talk about one. Okay. You asked it earlier. What's the biggest problem to preaching Deuteronomy? Paul. <laughs> Actually, it's not Paul. It's what we do with Paul. Let's see, we want slideshow. Some time ago, some of you remember Erwin Lutzer, pastor of Moody Church for a long time, a fellow Saskatchewan boy. I love the guy. It's wonderful uh, at, at many levels. But uh, at Moody Church, they host what's called the Whitfield Institute once a semester, once in the fall and once in the winter, for pastors like this, like y'all are here. And they have us in for dinner, uh, for, for lunch at the church, and then they bring somebody in to come and talk. And after my commentary on Deuteronomy came out, he said, Dan, I'd like you to come and talk about preaching the gospel from Deuteronomy. Well, I'd love to do that. So I started by reading Psalm 19. 
The Torah of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And so I, I, I read 7 to 14 of that text, and then I quoted several texts from Psalm 119. Have you ever read Psalm 119? 176 verses in this Ode to Torah. And I read a handful of verses out of there, and, and then I just said, you know, these verses are an embarrassment to lots of people. They are. Then as it turned out, when I was done, Erwin Lutzer got back up on the platform and he says, you know, they've always been an embarrassment to me. I did not know what to do with those texts. Well, I've got news for you. I had tried to have news for him too. <laughs> those two texts actually present the normative First Testament view of the law. This is bedrock. This is what the law as Moses intended it. We didn't talk about chapter 4, chapter 6. Here, I love this. When your son asks you in time to come saying, what are the statutes and the judgments and the laws that the Lord commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, I love that question. Have you ever had it happen at your house? The kids ask, why do we live the way we do? We had. It was over the, over the supper table. Our son was a swimmer at Moundsview High School in, in, in Shoreview, in Minnesota, in St. Paul. And his buddies were, his swimming buddies were his best friends. And I'll never forget one supper time, a, a warm conversation over the supper meal. All of a sudden, he blurts out, why do we have to live in such a prehistoric family? I said, thanks for the compliment. I mean, the tone of voice is not really so good, but I tell you, the question is perfect. That's what, what's the point of all these laws? When your son asks you in time to come, what's the point? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out from it. I didn't ask about that. I asked about the laws. Shh, I'll tell you. I'll get that. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. And he brought, I didn't ask about that. He brought us out from, in order to bring us in to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. Come on, Dad. I asked, what's the point of the laws? Shh. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes. Well, now you're finally there. To fear the Lord our God. And here, fear does not mean fright. It means awed, A-W-E-D, trust. Trusting awe. For our good always, and or for our survival. Those of you who've done Hebrew, this is the P-A-L form of the verb chaya, to live. The law is there for life as it is. And this, of course, is read that they may learn, hear that they may learn, that they may fear, that they may obey, that they may live for our, as it is today. And it will be righteousness. We will be declared righteous if we are careful to observe all this commandment. This is, it's the key to life. This is Deuteronomy. But, of course, here's the problem. What's the problem with Deuteronomy? It's Romans. For the promise to Abraham and his offering that he would be the heir of the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. Or Romans 7. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commands, produced me all kinds of covetous. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. We'd be better off not having the law. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the command came, sin came alive, and I died. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. 
for, the, what, uh, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh couldn't do by sending his own son in the likeness in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the command shall live by them. Corinthians. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from God, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But the Galatians, but the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law to become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, so that in Christ the blessing of Abram might come to the Gentiles, so he might proceed. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. If the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the Scriptures imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ in order that we might be justified by the Spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desire. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And, of course, in Galatians, you have the contrast between Jerusalem and Sinai. Paul, how can you do that? You know, so our theme song is, Free from the law, oh, happy condition. Now I can sin without fear of perdition. <laughs> you know, it's as if, God rescued the Israelites from Pharaoh, slavery, and at Sinai, He imposed on them a law heavier than anything Pharaoh demanded because apparently the Israelites couldn't keep that anyhow. What kind of tyrant would do that? Frankly, I'd rather be a slave of Pharaoh than a slave of that kind of God. And so, we feel so sorry for the Israelites. Finally, we are liberated from the law. Where did we get that? Moses never talks that way. The psalmist never talks that way. But Paul seems to talk that way. Here's the problem. And we take these Pauline anti-Judaism statements, and we put them in our glasses, and these become the lenses through which we read Moses. That was Luther's, it is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and I am so thankful that Luther discovered, rediscovered grace. I am so thankful. I am not so thankful about what Luther did to the First Testament, or to Jews, by the way. There are, there are lots of problems with Luther. And on this law versus gospel dichotomy, Luther's problem was he read Judaism into the First Testament, into Moses. I am convinced Paul is trying to recover Moses. That's the point. What's happened is they have substitute the Savior for the symbol of the Savior, the law. Even to this day, Jeffrey Teagay talks about, you know, you're familiar with the Torah scrolls that they have in, Jude, in Jewish worship? They often dress with a crown, and it's dressed in purple and all the rest. And Jeffrey Teague, you could go on the website, he talks about this. In Jewish worship, they parade the Torah scroll like other people parade their images of gods. And isn't that exactly the problem? Judaism, this, this is my view, Judaism is a problem because it has lost the spirit and gets stuck with a husk. And that's what Paul is dealing with. In Galatians, in Romans, he's not dealing with He's not fighting Moses. Think about it. God can't, I mean, Paul can't fight Moses. God doesn't speak out of two sides of his mouth. You know, in Moses, he says, it's the key to life. In Paul, he says, it's, it'll kill you. That's why we need Christ. 
No, you've got to... You, 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 you've got to let Paul and Moses be on the same team. So if Paul sounds like he's doing something else, ask Paul, how can you do that? And again, I'm not a New Testament scholar, but it, it seems to me Paul is dealing with the problem, not of Moses, but of what happens when you lose the spirit of Moses and you keep only the law of Moses. There's a rabbinic statement. I quote it in a couple of times in my commentary. One of the rabbis says, Oh, that my people would abandon me and keep my laws. And that's precisely the problem. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's first. That's primary. That's what God's about. It's not about the laws. It's about God, and it's about responding to God. And so, how we... Here's the biggest problem to dealing with Deuteronomy. It's a theological problem. It's a hermeneutical problem. What do I do with Paul? And one thing I will insist on, Paul cannot disagree with Moses. As if... When God inspired Moses, it was a mistake. It needs to be fixed. Later revelation can never fix earlier revelation. It can make it more clear, more crisp, more focused, whatever else it can do that, but that's not fixing. Later revelation cannot declare earlier revelation faulty. There's a theological issue here that we haven't even thought about the way we treat Moses and Paul. In my view, they have to be on the same page. And the key to preaching Deuteronomy is figuring that one out. And it is not making Deuteronomy fit Paul. It is understanding Pauline rhetoric. Paul, how can you do that? And there's an answer to that one. And to me, it's a very satisfying answer. And it doesn't force me to sacrifice Moses or anything else that God has done in his earlier revelation in the interest of Paul. But anyhow, that's my twisted interpretation. <laughs> Sorry. We appreciate your twisted interpretation. We can't thank you enough, Dr. Block, for your ministry to us today. And uh, certainly some of us will probably think about doing Deuteronomy soon. We'll use your notes, of course. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Remember that there is a uh, ministry leadership day coming in March, the beginning of March. I think it's the first or the second on a Thursday, and that will have Andreas Kostenberger with us, hmm. and he will be dealing with the theology of uh, manhood and womanhood huh. with us. And so it'll be a very practical, theologically practical uh, time together with him. Mm -hmm. Let's close ourselves in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we are so thankful that you've given us your whole word. Hmm. We thank you that the First Testament pointed to the one who has come in the Second Testament, to Jesus our Savior and our Lord. We thank you, Father, that we have salvation now in Christ. And we thank you that as we preach the whole word, we will see Jesus in it. We do pray, Father, that you will help us to be good interpreters of the word, whether it's the first or the second testament. Father, we commit ourselves to you, pray for safety as we drive home, and pray that you will be glorified this Lord's day as we gather with your people and minister your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>